Welcome back. We've been looking at sinusoids. Uh, this includes sines, cosines, and complex exponentials. In this video we're going to look at two new functions for us, two new signals. And in this video it's going to seem like um, these, these two new functions are not related to what we've recently been talking about, the sinusoids. But it turns out actually that there is a beautiful relationship between uh, these two new functions and complex exponentials. You won't see this relationship though until um, later on in the course where we can fully appreciate the relationship. But uh, what are these signals? Let's take a look. Okay, so I want to point out first that we're only going to be dealing with discrete time in this video. We'll come back to continuous time in a different video. And the functions we're going to look at are the impulse and the step functions. So we're going to start with the impulse, which is called sometimes the unit impulse. Okay, and we use the Greek letter delta. So delta of n is always going to mean the impulse function. And we define the impulse as being 1 when n is equal to 0 and 0 when n is not equal to 0. So we can make a plot of that. This is a very simple function. Say ha. And, and at the beginning of this, remember I said that this is related to those complex exponentials. So you know you might be interested in well, how is this simple signal related to those, uh, those sinusoids? And you, you will see the relationship later. Anyway, so this is an impulse, very simple. And uh, we would use the impulse to model things like um, a, a momentary switch in a circuit where you have zero voltage, zero voltage, zero voltage, and then you switch voltage in and then, then quickly it switched back out. Or a ball hitting a tennis racket. So there's zero force applied to the tennis racket, all of a sudden the ball hits and then it bounces right back off. Or maybe um, a speed bump on a car. So you're, you're driving on a flat surface, you go over a bump real quick and then you're back to a flat surface. Or uh, if you're a musician, maybe striking a tuning fork. There's zero force applied to the tuning fork, and you strike it very quickly, and then there's zero force again, and the tuning fork will have a response to that strike. It will vibrate at a very specific frequency. All right, so that's the impulse, and um, we're also going to look at the unit step today, also called just the step. And the step is... 1 when n is greater than or equal to 0, 0 when n is less than 0. And notice the equal sign is placed uh, at the 1. So it, it is 1 at the origin. So we can plot this thing. This is 1 for all positive time and at the origin. And it's zero else. Now sometimes I'll hear students say um, things like, oh the impulse is defined at the origin, or the impulse is only defined at the origin, or the, the unit step is only defined for positive time. Don't get caught up in saying things like this. The unit step and the impulse in discrete time are defined everywhere. The impulse is well defined over here. It's zero. Zero is a number. It's defined. The impulse is defined over here. This unit step is defined for negative time. It's zero. So these two functions are defined everywhere. Don't don't start saying things like it's it's not defined. Um, it, it's well defined. Now, I have a question for you, and that is, how are these two signals related? What sort of operation can we perform on one signal? to get the other signal. So what can we do to the impulse to get the unit step? Think about time transformations and so forth. And what sort of operations can we perform on the unit step to get the impulse? Pause the video and think about it. There are three different ways that these things are related. But for now, you know, we'll move on. And uh, I'm just going to give you the answer. Hopefully you pause the video. And we'll start with this. The impulse function is equal to the unit step minus a delayed version of the unit step. 
So, you know, why is that? Well, here's the unit step, u of n, and if I delay it, if I delay it, then that puts this edge at 1 here. And then all of these zeros are still zeros, and then these are all 1s. So here's 0. Now, so this is u of n minus 1. Now if I do the subtraction, if I do the subtraction, 0 minus 0 is 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. I get zeros all over here. And to the right of the origin, I get 1 minus 1, and I get zeros to the right. But at the origin, I have 1 minus 0, which is 1. So I have zeros, then a 1, and then zeros. I have exactly the impulse. So this, is, this relationship is true. And we call this operation the first difference. The first difference. So, um, first being that uh, we've subtracted or we've we've delayed the unit step by one. That's where the first comes from. And difference is we're doing the subtraction. So we would say that the impulse is the first difference of the unit step. Now, the second important relationship is kind of the the inverse operation to that. The unit step is this thing here. I'm just going to write down for right now and then we'll analyze it. A sum from m equals negative infinity to n of the impulse. Okay, so why is that? I'm just going to give myself some space here. Okay, so let's let's investigate this. And I'll just start by telling you that this sort of operation is called accumulation. So we would say that the unit step is the accumulation of the impulse. So and we would we would say that m is a dummy variable. It's an indexer, it's a dummy variable. So for instance, if I wanted to evaluate this thing, you need to get comfortable with this expression. If I wanted to evaluate it, I could look at, well, what's, um, how about the unit step at minus one? So I'm plugging minus one in for n. So let's see what happens here. I would say sum from minus infinity to minus one of the impulse. Okay, well, what do I get when I sum all of the samples of the impulse from minus infinity up to minus 1? Well, I'm adding a bunch of zeros. And so I conclude that the unit step at minus 1 is equal to 0. And it is. Now, what about if I plug in 0 for n? Well, this is a accumulation from minus infinity to 0 now of the impulse. So this is saying add up all of the samples from minus infinity to zero of the impulse. So minus infinity, minus infinity, oh, to zero. So now I get a one. So the unit step at zero is equal to one, and it is. And now you'll see that anything more than zero, like one, I'm having an accumulation that will include that spike in the impulse, and so this will give me 1, and so on. So really what what's happening here is that we're kind of defining a window in which to add all of these samples, right? We're accumulating all the samples in the window, and we're, we're moving this edge, depending on what n is, we're moving this edge left or right to perform the accumulation. Okay, let's move on to a third way that these guys are related. So we, would, we can say that the unit step is a sum from k equals 0 to infinity of delta of n minus k. Okay, why is that? Well, 
what do I get when I when I shift or when I when I just I guess I just gave the answer away, but when I put in a k here, k zero, k one, k two, k three, you know what does that do to the impulse? Well, that shifts it. It shifts it to the right because k is zero to infinity. K is positive. So when I subtract a positive number, that shifts the impulse to the right. And then what we're saying is add them all up with the sum. So what do I get when I shift the impulse a bunch of times to the right and add them all up? Well, I get the unit step, right? If I shift this thing once, now the spike is at 1. This would be delta of n minus 1. And if I shift it twice, the spike is at 2. Two. This is delta of n minus two, and, and if I keep doing that to, to infinity, right, and then I add the signals up. So adding the signals means point by point, adding them all up. Now you can see I have a spike, and then I have I would have this spike added to a bunch of zeros, and this spike added to a bunch of zeros. And so what I make when I do that addition is the unit step. So this is we would say this is a sum of shifted impulses. Okay, so that's how they're related to one another. I just gotta keep that up. Now, I wanna cover some important properties of the impulse, two of them. Two important properties. Okay, first of all, if I took the absolute value or the magnitude of every sample in the impulse, well, that wouldn't change the impulse because the impulse is never negative. It's either one or zero. And when I take the absolute value of one, I get one. And when I take the absolute value of zero, I get zero. So this does not change the impulse. And then when I square it, that does not change the impulse because uh, one squared is one and zero squared is zero. Now, if I, if I took that signal then and I added over all samples from minus infinity to infinity, what would I get? Well, that's a bunch of zeros and then exactly one, one, and then a bunch of zeros. So that sums to one. And do you remember what this was the equation for? Way back, one of the first videos, this is the equation for energy. Energy in a signal. So one important property of the impulse is that it, it has unit energy. All right, unit energy. All right, moving on to the second property. This is property one, second property. I'm gonna draw the impulse again. It's one at the origin. And zero everywhere else. And now let's say, so this is the impulse. Now let's say we have some other function and we're not going to, not going to say anything about it, so we're just going to kind of keep this general. So we have some other signal here, okay, and call this x of n. Notice when I do the multiplication of delta times x, 
What does that give me? Well, here's the origin. If I do delta times x, I get zeros times all this stuff. So I get zeros. Here's the origin. I get zeros here, zeros here, zeros here. I get zeros everywhere but the origin when I do a point by point multiplication of those two signals. At the origin, I have 1 times whatever this is. That's x of 0. So the, I get a height x of 0. So what is this thing? Well, it looks like an impulse. It's an impulse that is scaled by x of 0. Okay, x of 0 is just a constant, 2, 3, negative 4, or whatever. So I have an impulse-looking signal, but that has been scaled by this constant. So that's what this equation is telling us. So now, let me perform a sum from minus infinity to infinity of both sides of that equation. And x of 0 can come out of the sum because it does not depend on n. It's a constant. And we just said, what do I get when I sum the impulse over minus infinity to infinity? That's 1. So this gives me x of 0. So when I do this operation, when I take a signal, any signal, times the impulse, and then, in, uh, not integrate, sum over minus infinity to infinity, I get the value of that signal at zero. It, this is called the sifting property because sifting property because the operation sifts out or extracts the value of x, the value of our signal, at the origin. And we can generalize this by shifting the impulse around. Imagine taking the impulse and shifting it by k, then doing a point-by-point -point multiplication with the signal. Well, that would sift out the value of x at k. And we can make this even more general. We can say, I'm going to sum from a to b. So what would this be equal to? Well, this is going to give me it's going to sift out x of k if k is in this window. If, if, the, if the impulse has been delayed by something that's in this summation. So if a is in this window. But if, if the impulse is not in that window, if it's not in that summation, then we're adding up a bunch of zeros. Else. Okay, and this is the most general case of the sifting property. So we need to be aware of that. I'm going to give you an example now. Uh, let's look at an example. So maybe Maybe k is equal to 2. So we're going to shift the impulse by 2. OK, and maybe my, so this is delta of n minus 2. And maybe my signal looks like this. Okay, this is x of n. 
so let's let's try to understand this boxed equation. If I take if I take delta of n minus two and multiply it by x of n, see all these zeros get multiplied by non-zeros, and they make zeros. So 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 this point by point multiplication, this times this will give me zero, this times this will give me zero, zero, zero. I'll get zeros everywhere except this guy, which and this value is x of two. Right? So when I do the point by point multiplication, I get a delta looking function. In this case I get x of two, you know, at two, and I get zeros everywhere else. Okay, so this is, again, this is the multiplication of delta of n minus 2 times x of n. Now, I want to ask the question, what do I get when I sum from a to b? Well, if a is here, let's say, and b is here, so this is my window of summation, if I sum all of those samples, because k2 is in that window, then when I sum all those samples, I get x of 2, right? But if, if my window is somewhere here, right, a and b, and I sum all those samples in that window, because 2 is not in that window between a and b, then I'm summing a bunch of zeros, and so that would be the second case. Okay, so we've just spent some time looking at the impulse and the step function. What we did here was in discrete time, and so what we need to do next is look at how these things um, translate to the continuous time um, situation. So let's do that next.